Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and we are Navigating the Journey. Navigating the Journey is dedicated to exploring the options and choices for the end-of-life care and to assist people to talk about their wishes. Over the past six months, we have invited members of various religions and traditions to talk with us about the end-of-life customs in their culture. Today will be different. Now that the 2017 legislative session has come to a close, we can reflect upon the efforts and advancements, or not, this year and how they will impact Hawaii moving forward. Today, our guest is Representative John Mizuno, the former Vice Speaker of the House of Representatives, and I'm proud to say a supporter of our Medical Aid in Dying Bill. However, Representative Mizuno's office called and said he is tied up in traffic somewhere. So, what can I say? Um, he'll be here, of course. Uh, so let's talk about the legislature and what has happened or what did not happen for us. As you know, you've been with us all this time that we were supporting the legislation of medical aid in dying. And the bill is about the choices people make at the end of their lives. All the things we've been talking about. The people get to choose when you have a terminally ill person and the tumor is not going away or the cancer is just getting bigger and there's nothing else to do. The choice is yours. With this bill, the choice is yours. You get to make the choice. Do I want to go through the suffering? Has the suffering become intolerable? Is there another way to do this? And this bill offers an alternative. It's not, it is not something that anybody can do, should do, nobody gets to choose but the patient. The doctor doesn't get to choose, the family doesn't get to choose, the patient gets to choose. Do I want a prescription of something that will ease the pain and have me move on to the next world in peace and comfort. That is all the bill is about. It is not about getting rid of grandma. It is not about getting rid of people with all kinds of disabilities. Old age is not a terminal illness. I'm 79, that's not a terminal illness. People that have, that are disabled with handicaps, that's not a terminal illness. So all of those things that you've heard about the bill, forget, just forget it. It is not those things. This is just about the patient's choice to choose what they want and how they want. And that's all we've been talking about. The last six months we've talked about the different cultures, the different religions, the different traditions, and how they choose and what they choose at the end of life. We heard the Buddhist talk about the appreciation ceremony that they have at the end of life. Before the patient leaves this world, before the family, this is at home. And they have an appreciation ceremony where they talk to the patient and they tell them all the loving things and what it meant to them before they pass. Not after, not a funeral, but before, so the person knows we talked to the imam who says about in the Muslim tradition, they sing and they pray and they tell stories to the patient before they move on. And all of these different religions, all of the different traditions have a way of doing this. And so we are back to the choice, the choice that people have or don't have. And so the bill is about the choices. It is nothing else. 
You can't coerce anybody into doing something. In fact, in the bill, if you do coerce, it is a Class A felony. But, you know, people talk about that. If someone is determined to do something ugly, to get rid of somebody, they will find a way to do it. They don't need this bill. We read about it every day in the paper, on the news, about somebody getting rid of a relative. You don't need this bill. This bill is not about that. In fact, if you do coerce, if you do something to the patient, it's a Class A felony. Well, let's look at that. Okay, hospice, palliative care. They're wonderful, 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 wonderful. And I do recommend hospice. However, when the, if there was someone that wanted to get rid of the patient while they're in hospice, there's a lot of time when the patient is alone. They can do anything they want to do to get rid of the patient and nobody would know the difference. When the, when the person has passed, hospice signs the death certificate saying that it was cancer or whatever it was, and there are no autopsies. No one knows. So if a person wants to do something, they can do it. People find a way of getting rid of someone. Also in the bill it says that the witnesses to the person request, making this request, signing the declaration, cannot be a person that's going to inherit anything from them. It is not about them. It is about the patient. It is about the request. So we have to talk about it and to get, make it real clear, real clear, that this is the patient's choice, not anyone else's choice. And if you look at terminal sedation, terminal sedation, which is what so many people say is okay, is not okay. That's the doctor's choice. That is not the patient's choice. The doctor says, okay, make them comfortable. Let's, let's make them comfortable. They start giving them these heavy drugs until they disappear. That's not the patient's choice. That's the doctor's choice. So when we come back, when we come back, we want to talk to Representative Mizuno and about the rest of the legislature. And we'll be back in a minute. Aloha. You're watching Think Tech on thinktechhawaii.com, which broadcasts five live talk shows from noon to 5 p.m. every weekday and then streams our earlier shows all night long. Great content for Hawaii from ThinkTech. Hi, I'm Carol Cox. I'm the new host of Eyes on Hawaii. Make sure you stay in the know on Hawaii. Join us on Tuesdays at 12 noon. We will see you then. Aloha. Aloha, my name is Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I'm the host of Shrink Wrap Hawaii, where I talk to other shrinks. Did you ever want to get your head shrunk? Well, this is the best place to come to pick one. I've been doing this. We must have 60 shows with a whole bunch of shrinks that you can look at. I'm here on Tuesdays at 3 o'clock every other Tuesday. I hope you are too. Aloha. Freedom. Is it a feeling? Is it a place? Is it an idea? At Dive Heart, we believe freedom is all of these and more, regardless of your ability. Dive Heart wants to help you escape the bonds of this world and defy gravity. Since 2001, Dive Heart has helped children, adults, and veterans of all abilities go where they have never gone before. Dive Heart has helped them transition to their new normal. 
Search DiveHeart.org and share our mission with others, and in the process, help people of all abilities imagine the possibilities in their lives. Hi, and we're back. And we are with Representative John Mizuno, the former Vice Speaker of the House of Representatives. He was first elected to the House in 2006, representing District 30. And as a caveat, I was out campaigning for him, even when I didn't know him. Anyway, <laughs> after redistricting, he became representative for District 28, winning more than 70% of the vote in 2012. Mizuno has served as the chair of the Human Services Committee and also House Majority Whip. And prior to being elected, he was an ad administrative judge in California. Did I get that right? A special investigator in Hawaii and a legislative aide to Representative Dennis Arakaki and a graduate of the University of Hawaii and Willamette University College of Law. So welcome, Thank welcome, you. welcome. And for those of you that don't know, I can't imagine there's anybody that doesn't know, you have chaired every committee and you, your work with youngsters and all of those committees. Tell us, first of all, Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. And Marcelo, <laughs> thank you for having me, by the way. And so, and where do we start? Tell us, tell me about you. You, just you. What, sure. what, do you, what makes you want to do what you do? Because I know the salary isn't that great. So no. <laughs> what makes you want to give like you do, to do what you do? The list of committees and outside activities just takes up all of your time. So wh what's that about? Thank you so much. And, and yeah, the, it's not for the pay, obviously. Um, the benefit we have to make a positive difference, to be a game changer for our keiki, our kapuna, our disabled, um, our homeless, people that have been marginalized, that's priceless. That's a once in a lifetime gig that you can get. And so uh, we all have term limits. The, the day that they vote us out, that's our term limit. Mm -hmm. And uh, good Lord has given me a, a nice window of opportunity, and I've done my best to run with it. Again, the focus will be on our keiki, our kapuna, our disabled, our homeless. Again, people that have been marginalized, at the same time supporting small business and our beautiful state of Hawaii. Now, speaking of marginalized, when I first met you, I think, after we campaigned for you in a Thank didn't, you, by the way. <laughs> that I didn't know who in the world this kid was, because he was a kid. I, said, I don't know, but we were out there for you. However, I think the first time we really worked together was for the Marshallese, speaking of marginalized people. And I guess standing up to uh, governor, The governor and the director. And Dr. the director, <laughs> yes. <laughs> standing up to them and looking, having them look at the Marshallese as real people, not Kofa, not them, real people. I think that was the start of a, a beautiful partnership and relationship with you, Marsha Rose. Um, you and I took a, a very difficult stance. It's unfortunate, but there's still discrimination um, in a paradise and molten pot like Hawaii. Uh, some of our people um, have disdain to uh, our Micronesian people. And at the time, Governor Lingo and her director, Kohler, they were going to stop all health care benefits to our, our citizens, our, our mm -hmm. compact citizens, Marshall Islands, <laughs> Yap, Chirk, yeah. Marshall, um, uh, Micronesians. Yeah. Basically, they're going to cut out health care. Now, these were the people that were getting chemotherapy, the people that were getting um, dialysis treatment. I surmise if you stop your chemotherapy or your dialysis treatment, you're going to die. I, there was no other way. And, you and I uh, were joined hip and hip in that fight, and we fought a very valiant fight against Governor Lingo and against the Director of Human Services, Director Kohler. And Judge Seabright found in our favor. It was Sound versus Kohler. And in federal district court, Judge Seabright ruled in our favor. We were able to save thousands of lives because of that, and I'll never forget that. Thank you. We really uh, were connected from that point on. <laughs> And it seemed to me that we were out there by ourselves. 
Now, I'm sure we weren't, but it seemed, it felt it, like it. It felt like it because it wasn't a popular issue at, at the time, and it still is today. There's a little bit of negative stigma with um, our people who are uh, Micronesian descent. And the, the point is, we bombed that area, 67 atomic blasts. Now, Project Bikini was out of this world. It annihilated and poisoned with radiation their sea, their lands, and everything. And so the U.S. government was not uh, without sin. And we, we have a great debt to pay, and we needed to address that. But to cut off someone's dialysis treatment, they're going to die. And so I, I couldn't stand back on the sidelines and do nothing. I was so honored that you joined me. And at, at a point, it was only you and I that was <laughs> with the And uh, Victor Gemignani from Appleseed. Yes. Only us Apple three. Seed, yes. And it seemed uh, very lonely at the time. It did. It did. I wrote an article, Murder, She Wrote. And it was about exactly that. And everybody was saying, oh, you shouldn't do that. Don't do this. Don't. No, 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 no. We've got to say it. Yes. We've got to say it. Absolutely. Yeah. So, now, you are... Um, when you were vice speaker, what, what does a vice speaker do? Basically, you're second in command out of the 51 members. So when speaker's not in, you're signing all the committee reports or what have you, approvals, approval slips, uh, people that are going to be taking uh, legislative trips, you're approving that, day-to-day -day operations, what have you. In addition, you're also working to keep the caucus together many times during the session. And even during the interim, there's some small little fires that you have to put out here and there. And so really, it's a, a different mindset. You're not in charge of a committee. However, you kind of are responsible for the entire caucus and trying to keep the members um, happy, but legally within the bounds of law. And so that's what we really do. But the caucus, because there's only six people that aren't Democrats in the House, that's a big caucus. Absolutely. You are correct. And so you have all these different factions in the caucus? Yes, yes. Because the Democratic group is so big, we are the, the supermajority. Um, there's, you know, a little infighting, to be honest. Was that what this last takeover was? Um, no, I think honestly, and God bless Speaker Suki, he's the only guy that's been Speaker twice in the uh, House of Representatives history. So that he's lived a legendary political career, and I just love the guys as my father. Um, nevertheless, I believe that the members just wanted a new direction and a change. So um, it wasn't so much infighting. It was just that it was the time had come where we needed to um, move to a new chapter in the book at the legislature. And unfortunately, we had to do that, and that's what happened. I still love Speaker Suki. He's oh, I been do like too. a father. He's been, been a friend of mine. Uh, we had our battles over the years, but he, it, we always came out as friends. No, in fairness, yeah. I disagreed with him, too. And he allowed me to express myself in closed doors. He allowed um, me to, to fight, and then he'd smile, and it was... He likes a good challenge. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, now, between now and when October, what happens? Because we are a biennial... Well, tell tell oh, the uh, audience. No, no, we're, so we're bicameral, but we have every year no, we have a... the two-year biennial. Oh, you're right. Okay, this uh, is the 29th legislature. Right, and so you have two sessions within this one... Legislature. Yeah. You are absolutely correct. So the, the odd year is the beginning, and the even year is the election. <laughs> Your political whiz. <laughs> <laughs> so... So what happens in these months between the actual legal session? What, what are you doing? Great question. Excellent question. We're going to regroup. We're going to look at all the controversial bills that came before us, many of the bills that didn't pass, and we're going to review them and see, is it worth taking it up again? Because it's been a hot button issue, and it seems like the entire uh, state, uh, are, they're clamoring for certain bills and issues to be heard. Doesn't mean we're going to pass it, but at the end of the day, if this is what the people want and we represent the people of Hawaii, we should listen to their concerns and at least give a fair hearing on a number of these bills that are still right now um, either deferred but still alive in the committee. So if it's um, deferred, like our pet and everybody that watches us knows that we're 
It's about medical aid and dying. So it's been deferred. That what happens? Does the same committee go back to the same committee? Can you move it to another committee? Excellent question. Get, you know, what, why go back to the same committee if it's the same people with the same attitudes? Well, you know, um, Marsha Rose, you bring up some very good points. And the, the, you, there's a number of legal mechanisms that you could do. One would be to pull that bill, the Senate bill, out of the Health Committee and have a vote on the floor. Um, in order to do that, I think you need a uh, at least 17. I had the numbers well broken it down. 17. 17 out of the 51 it, members. And then 26 to pass. 20, At least 26, a majority to yeah. pass it. Um, now, that's it's it's kind of difficult because now it's as if you don't have the trust of your health chair. And so you're going to hurt the health chair's um, not only feelings, but it just doesn't look good. Then it, there's no guarantee that judiciary will hear the bill. So even if you were to do a, you'll pull it out of committee and vote it on the floor, and hypothetically, just we just say that we had 26 that supported it or more, it would move on to judiciary. There's no guarantee that judiciary chair will hear that bill or pass it out of his committee. And the same thing happens. Even if he did, we'd have to vote it on the floor again, and then the Senate would have to agree our, our, agree, um, our amendments or it'll go to conference. Chances are with a bill this big, It'll go to conference. We really need to vet it and make sure it's proper. Uh, the other thing, though, very good point. With a bill that has such a, a wide-ranging magnitude to the people of Hawaii, and if we were to pass something as historic as this, I believe Hawaii would be the seventh state with um, the compassion yeah. in, in dying for our, our patients that are um, in a bad situation. It, it would probably be prudent to maybe introduce a new bill from the House start anew with and load it with as many safeguards as you can because to me the game is not on the senate it's in the house because the senate easily passed it was it 22 to 3 yeah that tells me that that 85 90 percent of the senate's on board the house is the is where the question mark lies and so because we have such a contentious bill not for the senate but for the house it might be prudent to launch a house bill with all the proper protections in there talk to the health committee members and of course speaker psyche and the leadership team if it's their will perhaps we hear a new bill and even though some people may have reservations they feel that it has enough safeguards it may just get out of the health committee if it does it goes to floor vote and then it goes to judiciary those are the two big committees it needs to pass health and if it passes health judiciary um, then it'll go to the senate they will disagree with our amendments because they're going to put some of their own amendments in there and we'll see it in, in conference should this come up in 2018. So, well, I, I still have a, an issue about if we have the same people on the health committee that had issues the last time, why are we doing this again with Another good question, uh, Marshall. With them. Good, another it, good it, question. And, and I got two answers for you. First, the uh, as you know, Della Bellotti was a chair of health, and. We just think the world of her. She's an outstanding leader. She's now going to be the new vice speaker. So you're going to have a new health chairman, um, and it will be so, publicized soon enough. But we, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. But, so, so with the new chairman, you may also get new committee members. Oh, that's where I was going with this. That's dynamic but, change. That's a dynamic change. If because you have, we, if we just change the chair and we still have these same people, then what good is it? What, there's a lot of good. I'll explain why. Okay, so, so you have a new chairman. Right. You have a new one or two new committee members, which may change the that vote. Would, that would be that, that, that could flip be, if yeah. it's a, a three four or four three. If you all add one or two other members, it could be a five to three vote in favor of a bill. That that's a dynamic change. Second, the content. I think at this point, if we're going to introduce a bill of such a mag of such magnitude. We need to make sure all the safeguards are in there so that the health committee members would feel a little better. Some of them might vote with reservations, but nevertheless, that's the key. If we can move it out of health, it'll probably pass the floor vote and then go to judiciary, and judiciary will probably pass it. That's just a rough count. So yes, the dynamics can be changed, and it's not only the new chair. More importantly, we might may have new members and the bill's got to be probably new content altogether. Because right. if we don't change the content and put enough safeguards, you're still going to have those three, four, five voters okay. against it. So 
let's assume we rewrite and do all the things you're saying, right? Whatever that is, I, and you know, some of times it's just a word here and a word there. Now, but I have been campaigning, and so have other people, to have a doctor on the health committee. A health committee, we have an elected doctor. Why don't we have a doctor on the health committee? We could, I believe, though, he, because Dr. Cragen chairs agriculture, it, it, it conflicts with this time. What do you and mean he's conflict? A farmer. It's, it can't go on at the same time. I think it's a morning bracket committee. And so oh, Health so and Human Services morning bracket. So oh, he oh you mean they meet at the same time his committee meets? Yes. Is that what you Yes. Ah. That's a conflict uh, because he was on a health committee before. He was a member. I think he was a vice chair. Uh, but once he got his own committee as agriculture chair, he, it's the time's conflict. And so he had to take that over health. And since he's a chair of agriculture, I think he's going to stay there. Oh. Oh, fooey. No, no, well, nevertheless, so <laughs> the, the, that's why it's great that we have the interim because now we can name a new chairman for the health committee and possibly one or two new members, and it, it's a game changer. The dynamics are changing. And so when you talk to the members that uh, would have voted no and tell them, had these safeguards been in place, would you change your vote to yes or WR? Todd said he would. Todd would. I think you have two or three others that would. So, it again, it's a game changer, and it's a dynamics of everything. So I wouldn't rule it out. I will say this. In an election year, it's very difficult to get a controversial bill heard, and only 10% on the average bills that are introduced pass. That's a 90% chance that our bill will not pass. Well, we are going to put together a cadre of voters to a give comfort to those who will take this chance or to defeat those who don't. So, thank you for coming. Thank you for being my friend. Thank you, thank you, thank you for always being there. And we look forward to whatever comes of your new venture in the legislature, however that works out. But you'll let us know, right? I'll definitely let you know. Um, you once keep, it's, in, keep in touch. Once it's made public, I... You'll be one of the first that I call. Okay, now, where, where, where is your office? Uh, I'm in room 439, fourth floor on the state capitol. Still on the fourth floor? Still on the fourth floor. Okay, great, so I can find you. You can always find <laughs> me, Marsha Rose. <laughs> Thank you so much. This has been a pleasure spending this time with it's you. It's been my honor always working with you, and I enjoy how we work things out and talk, and we even, in a nice way, challenge each other. <laughs> but it makes us better, so yes. I've always been glad to work with you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Aloha. You. And we'll see you next week.